We've got our live stream audience coming in now. And during this time, uh, across our nation, we have paused and recognized uh, the event of uh, 9-11, uh, 19 years ago, I believe. And uh, our nation was shaken. I'm going to make a few comments about that. But what we wanted to do, first of all, is just show you a video. This is not, this is not a really graphic one. We decided this year to look at some of the memorial that has been erected in their honor. There's a very beautiful song that was written that would go with it, and I, it spoke to my heart. I hope it will yours. And so we're going to show you that, and then I'm going to make a few comments about it, and, uh, uh, and then we'll have a special, okay?
Is there a bomb that can heal these wounds that last a lifetime long? And when the stars have burned to dust, hand in hand we still will stand because we Day in our nation's history. Every year the History Channel plays a montage of interviews. Thankfully it's without professional commentary. There is no Barack Obama or Jimmy Carter or any of the Blame America First crowd that always seeks to find some reason why we're such a horrible and rotten nation for the tragedies that take place here. The only voices that were heard on that um, program were the voices of people on the street as it happened. And as they talked and the fear in their voices of our nation being attacked, it, the sight of the Twin Towers falling, the Pentagon burning, the wreckage of that plane and that Pennsylvania feel, we all of a sudden realized that, that America in many ways would never be the same. The feeling of the fact that we were safe left us that day. We realized that there were people amongst us that would annihilate our way of life and to some degree our, our safety disappeared in the burning ashes of ground zero and we became familiar with words and measures at airports and code red and so many other things that we had never even heard before. And yet there were other changes that took place within us, and that is the fact that we began to realize who it was that was the real heroic segment of our culture and our society. I think that's very, very important. 9-11 changed at that time who we truly considered heroic and honorable, we learned who our real heroes were. We've always been a nation that has been enamored with celebrities and superstars. We've elevated people for reasons that didn't have a great deal of depth to them. But on that day, we found our heroes not on the red carpet of high society, but on the asphalt and concrete of, of of everyday life. In, in the greatest tragedy that our nation had ever faced since Pearl Harbor, we found out that it was the grunt. It was the everyday Joe. It was the fireman. It was the policeman, those that walked the thin blue line. It was the city worker, the everyday Joe that happened to be in the wrong place at the right time and waded into the ash 
and rubble and snatched life from death. Those were the guys that were, and ladies that were our hero. Firemen went up into the tire, towers to save people that could not save themselves. Everyone else was coming down and they were going up. And so I think that day that we found out that bra bravery is not found on a ball field. And, and can I just say from the depths of who I am and every ounce of conviction that I have in me, if you're looking for a hero, don't look, don't look to the NBA or the NFL or Major League Baseball. I'm not sure there's a more disgusting conglomerate of individuals in our nation at this time to be found. Doesn't, doesn't take true honor to win an Oscar, but it does take character to give your life for others. And while the grunts of our culture are not comfortable in front of a camera, nor are they, are they seeking adoration, I think it was fitting that the athlete and the celebrities lost center stage on that day and that it was indeed the grunt that took the focus and stood head and shoulders above all the rest of us. And they still do in the hearts of true Americans. It is said by politicians around our nation, we will never forget, but they have. They have forgotten. They're defunding, belittling, and cursing the very people that pulled our nation together 19 years ago. I saw a picture today of a young girl walking in front of a fire truck, making an obscene gesture at them. And I thought to myself, if you're ever in top of a building and need somebody to come get you, those are the guys that will come get you. We have educated a generation of fools. They don't know where they came from. They don't really know what they believe. They're finding joy in being anarchists and Marxists and arsonists. And it's a tragedy. And so I, I think that as patriotic Americans, we ought to stand, you ought to thank a policeman. We do stand for the thin blue line. We're not against people that, are, that wear any uniform that are crooked and dishonest and break laws. But we do stand for those that protect our freedom and keep us safe at a time when there are those amongst us um, who do not really love the America that you and I love. And so thank a policeman, thank a fireman, take them out to eat, show, show them your expression of gratitude for who they are. And pray for those families because this is an anniversary every year that they go through. And uh, my brother-in-law was one of the first people into the Pentagon after the explosion. And uh, he's the fire chief of Manassas County. And the things that he described to me that he saw are things that cannot be wiped from the mind during a lifetime. And the people that burn our streets and that set fires even to this day, I don't, care, I don't care where they came from, they're of the same character as those that flew planes into our towers. So I pray for our nation that we'll come back and have enough wisdom to realize the freedom that God's given us and to protect it and uh, to enforce our laws. Well, Carissa's gonna sing for us now, so I want you to listen to her. And then we'll get right into the book of Nehemiah. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
land of the free, sweet home of liberty, but it came at such a great price. Many soldiers, brave and true, grateful for America. Thank the Lord for the joy and the privilege of living in our nation. We pray for our leaders and pray for our, our, uh, those that are uh, protecting us and we want to continue to do that. Open your Bible, if you will, this morning to the book of Nehemiah. We're in the book of Nehemiah. We're going to be looking in chapter number two. Nehemiah and chapter number two is where we're going to be. Nehemiah chapter and number 2. And in, in our place here, if, if you recall last week we got to a place, we, we talked about how that the Babylonians had left the city of Jerusalem in shambles. And not only were the uh, gates burnt and the walls were in rubble, but the people were being tormented by their adversaries. It was a great time of distress in the city of Jerusalem. Some Jews had been allowed to go back um, uh, after the Persians had uh, supplanted the Babylonians, but they found the task of rebuilding the city far too intimidating. It was bigger than they were, and so they were attempting this project under the strength and energy of their own flesh. And, It was just too big for them. There are going to be times in your life you're going to face things that need to be done, but it's going to be bigger than you are. So the question then must be decided as to whether you will attempt it in your flesh or you'll attempt it in the work and the strength that God can give you. Not by might, nor by power, you know. What God wrote, but by my spirit saith the Lord, to Zerubbabel. And so we need the Lord's help in so many areas of our life. And so for 150 years, the walls sat in ruin and rubble. 150 years. Nobody did anything about it. But then Nehemiah, who was cupbearer to the king of Persia, got word from his visiting brother about the condition of his beloved home city. 
And he told him, the walls are in ruin, the gates have been burnt, the people are in disarray. You wouldn't like what you would see, Nehemiah. The city is just ransacked. Oppressive enemies come in and out. Nothing is done. A little bit like America today. Nothing's done. The walls are down. The walls are down. And so, Nehemiah the cupbearer did what the princes, the priests, and everybody else would not do. He sat about to get busy rebuilding the wall. And I asked you a question last week. The question was, can you live with the rubble? Can you, can you walk around and stumble over and make your way through the rubble of life and live that way for the rest of your life, or do you need to do something to do it? Can you coexist with charred beams and charred dreams? That's the question. And so if the answer is no, then we've got to do what Nehemiah did in our first study, and that is we have to begin with the burden. When he heard these things, what did he do? He sat down and wept and, and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So we have to begin with a burden because it's a burden. Listen, listen, cold, hard facts will not move you. If it doesn't transfer to your, head, to your heart from your head, if your facts of the condition of your life, if it does not move you inside who you are, you'll do nothing about it. It's got to become a burden. And then we talked about the fact that a burden will cost you something. It always brings responsibility, and it's so important that we get busy doing what God's called us to do. Now, I want you to look with me, and we'll pick up reading today, because Nehemiah now, remember, he went out and he viewed the walls at night. Didn't tell anybody what he was doing. Didn't ask permission. Didn't seek encouragement or discouragement. He knew what God wanted him to do, so he set about obeying the Lord. Verse number 17. Then said I unto them, that's the people, ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we may be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. And so they strengthened their hands for the good work. Verse number 1 of chapter 3. Let's jump there. Then Eliab the high priest rose up with his brethren the priests, and they builded the sheep gate. Verse 2, And next unto him builded the men of Jericho. Verse 3, But the fish gate did the sons of Hassanah build. Verse 4, And next to them repaired Merimoth, the son of Urijah, the son of Kuz, and next to him the men of Meshulam. Verse 5, And next to them the Tekoites. Verse 6, And the old gate repaired Jehoiada. Verse 7, and next to them repaired Meliatia. Verse 8, next to him prepared uh, Uziel. Next to him, in the middle of that verse, also repaired Hananiah. And if you'll go down from verse 9 and 10 and 11 and 12, all the way down, next to him and next to them, and the valley gate repaired this group, and, and after him repaired this group, and next to him repaired that group, and all the way down through the closing of the chapter, You'll find, you'll find that somewhere, everywhere, somebody did the work. In every place, in every gate, in every nook and cranny, somebody was doing the work. Father, help us. Give us what we have need of today. And Lord, we'll be grateful to you. Give us strength in our life, that we might build the wall. And we'll thank you in Christ's name. Amen.
The first thing that I want us to notice as we look at this, that is simply that the weight preceded the work. Now, I think that's very, very important for you and I because we live in a day of, of instant everything. We want it. We want it now. You know, we don't want to wait. Whatever it is in life that can give us the shortcut to where we want to go, we're happier with that. So we want to microwave it. We don't want to let it sit in the oven very long. We just want to zap it and eat it and be done with it. And, and, and sometimes that's the way that we live life. You would think with Nehemiah that after enduring the process that got him here, he would be chewing at the bits to get in and get the work going and get the job done. You would think that he would be so antsy once he arrived in Jerusalem that, 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 that he could finally do something about what had burdened his heart in such a great way. But notice verse number 11 of chapter 2. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. And so for the first three days, you know what Nehemiah did? Absolutely nothing of any consequence. God doesn't even tell us what he does during those three days. It's just that he was there three days, probably acclimating himself to the climate and the culture and mincing amongst the people, listening to their voice, finding out their moods, how defeated they were, how discouraged they were. Nehemiah, for three days, rather than jumping in and being busy, 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 Nehemiah spent some time uh, just sort of getting himself adjusted and settled in his quarters and probably was all eyes and ears as he walked about the street. Now what does that tell us? It tells us that number one, Nehemiah probably wasn't as reactionary as he was responsive. And I think that sometimes it would do us very well if we realize the importance and the difference even in being reactionary and responsive. Reactionary person immediately does something uh, in, in a direct uh, reaction to whatever has happened. A responsive person takes time to think it over. I don't know if you're like me, but probably all of us at some point or another have reacted in a manner that later we regretted. I wish I had not said that or done that. I wish I had not reacted in such a manner. And we're left having to apologize, eat a little crow, because of the fact that we reacted rather than responding. Re reaction means we're, we are living under the power of the flesh, so we react. Responding means that we take time to think about what's going on and allow the Holy Spirit to work and, 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 and move within us. And sometimes, listen carefully, sometimes, listen, sometimes the work hinges upon our willingness to wait. Because if we jump in all haphazard and, and, and all um, gung-ho, we haven't taken the time to really get ready and to really repair. Sometimes when we react, we don't take time to pray. So we go in under our own power and without the help of the Lord, we do it on our own. And sometimes the work would actually be better done if we preceded it with waiting until God gives us the okay. I remember, I remember when the nation of Israel was being attacked in the valley of Rephaim. And David prayed before the God and he said to God, What do I do? When do I go? What do you want from me? And God said this, I want you to go sit under the mulberry trees until you hear the sound of rustling in the top of the mulberry trees 
And when you hear the blowing of the wind in those mulberry trees, that's when I want you to move. David won a great battle that day. What if David, what if David had bypassed the mulberry trees? What if David had plowed ahead and gone on his own and just jumped into the battle because he was a warrior? What would have happened to David? How many men would he have lost? He would have faced the enemy without the help of God. So sometimes you and I need to look for mulberry trees, don't we? Now I want you to look at me and listen to me. I know we get to the place sometimes where we think we can figure it out. But God knows more about the situation than you and I do. So waiting is an important thing. Can I just tell you this? That God's timing is a very, very vital part of God's will. Listen, God's timing is a very vital part of God's will. And sometimes it's not just being where God wants you to be, doing what God wants you to do. Sometimes the key is being, being there when God wants you to be there. When we were coming to Idaho um, years ago, we had our plans on when we would arrive and what time we'd start door knocking, and that time of door knocking would, would work out best for us because it would be warmer weather. And so we had it all planned out and everything set and go, but the guy that was going to bring our stuff out couldn't do it until later on in the fall. So Susie and I sat down at a table, and we were a bit frustrated, and, and I said to her, I said, we might as well just settle down. We can't go now. God's not made it available. Later her father passed away and we were on the East Coast and able to attend his funeral and help the family in that regard. And then we came out here and the building that we were going to meet in, which was the daycare in our first building, the daycare wasn't ready. If we had come earlier, we would have never found the daycare. And I, I met Amy Wilson who ran it and what a joy and a blessing she's been to our life and our ministry and what a good friend. She allowed us to meet there, and boy, that gave us our, our footing. We were out door knocking, and they went by Max and Carolyn's house and left to fly. We probably never would have met them had we come earlier. Can I just tell you this? God's timing is very, very important. You may know what God wants you to do, and you may know where God wants you to do it, but you may not know exactly when it is that God wants you to go. Find a mulberry tree and sit under the mulberry tree until God sends the rustling in the tree and gives you the absolute go ahead. What do you do when, what do you do when God is silent? Nothing. Where do you go when God hasn't told you where to go? You don't go at all. When God hasn't said go, you stay put, stay where God is has you. And so here is Nehemiah, and he's waiting for three days on what God wants. Psalm 37, verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And I remind you again, so are his stops. We love the steps. We hate the stops. We love the work. We hate the wait. We like to get in. We don't like to sit down. But there are times in our life that we have to do that. The steps and the stops are important in the life of a believer. Have you ever been in a car that all you had was a gas pedal? You better go real slow or you got a lot of trouble. I visited India one time and I'll tell you one thing, there are three things vital on a car in India. Brakes, Gas, obviously, and a horn. You've got to have all three. And I'm going to tell you, without the brakes, without the brakes, there's a wreck coming somewhere down the line. And so stops are as important as the steps are. David said in Psalm 25, verse 5, Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day long, David said. God, I'm just waiting to hear from you. 
what you want me to do. Psalm 25, 21, let integrity and uprightness preserve me for I wait on thee. Psalm 27, 14, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Psalm 37, verse 7, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him that oppresseth in his way because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Just stay put. Preacher, sure things are getting out of hand. That's all right. Just stay put. God's still in control. Psalm 57, 9. Because of his strength will I wait upon thee, for God is my defense. Psalm 62, 5. My soul, wait thou upon God, for my expectation is from him. And the classic verse, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. But they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up his wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, they shall walk and not faint. Now look at me and listen. Waiting on God is never wasted time. Waiting on God is never wasted time. If you don't know when, then wait. If you don't know where, then wait. If you don't know what, then wait, because God knows all of those th things. And in His timing, God will give you the okay and the go-ahead. Number two, not only did the wait precede the work, but assessment preceded action. Now, I'm talking about you for a moment, me. So let's think about this. Let's, let's, let's learn a lesson from Nehemiah. All right, there's rubble. We talked about that. Can you live with the rubble? No, nope, can't do it. I don't like living this way. I don't want this. I want to make a change in my life, okay? Here's what you've got to do. You've got to assess how that change is going to happen. What's it going to cost you? How do you go about it? How do you change your life? How do you alter your direction? What do you have to do to bring a difference into your life where you can live without the rubble and ruin? How do you do that? That's important. Because if you don't, listen, listen, this is important. If you don't take time to assess the situation as you wait on God. What did Nehemiah, what, what, what did he do? He went out, looked at the walls, but he waited first. And in that waiting, I believe in his mind, he's beginning to think about what God has called him to do. He had four months prior to that. So you're talking about, you're talking about, uh, uh, over four months now, he's been ruminating on this and thinking about it. He's making an assessment. If you don't do that, then what happens is you're running on emotion. You're just running on emotion. And emotion runs out. Emotion doesn't last long. If you're just emotionally involved, you, you know, come on. you got to think about it. What's it going to cost you? I've had people come to me and say, Preacher, I'll tell you what, here's, I, I want to jump right in. Okay, that's great. I'm excited. But the emotion doesn't last. My first pastorate years ago, I had a guy come to church, and he, after church he came up to me, and he, I'm just a young guy. He said, uh, Pastor, uh, I want to take, the bus route we need a bus captain for. And I said, great. And he said, I'm excited. I said, good, man, this is awesome. We'll have a meeting this week and get you set up. And, and uh, he was going to be gone. I said, all right, well, we'll talk Sunday and set the time up. And he said, okay. So next Sunday came around, he wasn't there. The next Sunday came around, he wasn't there. The next Sunday came around, he wasn't there. In fact, I didn't see him again. I mean, I, I believe in waiting on the Lord, but that, that's a little long, okay? And so three years later, he came back to church, 
And I was so glad to see him. And I'm, I remember now, I'm young in the ministry, so I'm learning how all this works. And as he left, I just said, man, it's good to see you. And he said, is the bus route still available? Sort of, sort of funny. Well, the problem is, that was emotion. He, he wasn't a bad guy. He, he meant well, but he was running on emotion. He had never assessed the situation and what it was exactly that he wanted to do. So we, we got to realize that before we get into action, there has to be an assessment, and it helps you plan your course of action and, and determine what you're going to need to get it done. Now, now look at me. Listen to me. It could be if you're going to change your situation and you've got to, you're listen, if you're going to make an honest assessment of your life, you may have to break off some friendships. Because evil communications corrupt good manners. And, and you can't become and do what God wants you to do when, when you're surrounding yourself with bad influences that are pulling you in the other direction. So you better make an assessment because for you to really live for God, you may have to say goodbye to some friends that are holding you back. I would just venture to, 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 to say this. I can certainly say it from my life. Anybody here that's serving God, at some point in their life, had to, had to walk away from friendships that, that were detrimental to their spiritual health. Preacher, I'm not willing to do that. Well, that's a good assessment. You're being honest. So live in the rubble. Enjoy the rubble. Because you, you, can't, you can't clean it out until you make an assessment and are willing to do the things. Notice verse 13, chapter 2, verse 13. Nehemiah says, and I went out by night, this is, a, this is, this is fascinating, so I, I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, and, and to the dung port, and, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Would you, would you notice that phrase, viewed the walls, viewed the walls? The word viewed has its root in a medical term that means examination. If you go to a doctor and he examines you, you're going to want him to be thorough. It's not a, just a casual glance, you know. Well, you're hurting in your abdomen, you need open heart surgery. No, no, that, that scares me, okay? Give me some time. Let's talk about this. Let's, let's talk. Tell me how you came to your assessment. It's through a thorough examination that you come to the idea that this is your problem and this is the solution to it. This is your problem. This is the solution to it. Okay? Now listen carefully. Nehemiah didn't go out and just say, well, look at this, Shazam. I'll tell you what, there's a lot of rocks around here. No, Nehemiah viewed it. What does that mean? He carefully examined what was before him. I've said to young people before, dude, what's wrong with you? What are you thinking? You keep running with this crowd and wonder why you're in trouble? Can't you figure out? that they're the root of your problem? Why don't you examine how you're living? Why don't you examine who your friends are? Why, why don't you, and I preach this at teen camps, why, why don't you examine what's happening in your life? Because until you examine it and make a good detailed assessment of it, you can't change. I've been in houses before and pulled families out that were beaten by a drunken husband. Gone in physically and rescued them. Only to have her go back to another alcoholic. And I'm like, what did I, what did I go through that for? Examine, what, what are you doing? That's the same situation you were in before. Why would you go back to the same situation? 
So in our time of assessment, we have to, we have to examine what's going on. Why, why am I living in this rubble? Why am I here? What have I done to help create? Don't, don't look. No, 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 no. We're not pointing our finger at everybody else. No, no. What decisions have I made? to place me in the middle of a pack of rubble in my life? Why are my walls broken down? Why are the gates charred and burned? And what can I do about it? We have to take those steps, and the only way we can do that, the only way we can do that is through examination. We have to make an examination, okay? Everybody focus on me. We have to make an examination. Nehemiah could not afford to go in half prepared. He had to count the cost. And to do that, he had to put his eyes on the destruction. Now look at me. Listen to me. Everybody look at me. you got to look at what's wrong. That's what viewing. you got to face up. you got to look at And that may lead you to the mirror. You have to look at what's wrong. i got to look. i got to face this. If you're not willing to do that, there can be no change. I talk with people all the time, but they're not willing to face the destruction in their life and why they are where they are. Luke chapter number 14, verse 28, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Luke chapter uh, 14, verse 31, Or what king going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000. You see, Nehemiah's heart had led him there, but he needed his brain in gear if he was going to be successful in rebuilding what was destroyed. Let me say that one more time, and I'm going to go to my, my next point. Your heart may be leading you somewhere, and you may with your heart say, I want out, but you better get your brain in it. you got to look and assess, why am I in this mess? View it, examine it, and determine what steps have to be taken to move on. Now just real quickly, let me just give you point three, and then we'll close out. In point three, he shared his vision with other people. Why? Because we're not an island unto ourselves. Did you know this? Whatever trouble you have in your life, you probably need some encouragement and help. And, 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 and we should encourage people that are genuinely, truly trying to be different in their life. God hasn't called us to discourage people. We should exhort. We should be exhorters. And so much the more as we see the day approaching, the Bible said. So we ought to exhort each other. I think it's important that we note what Nehemiah did not do. He didn't blame anybody else. Well, you sorry bunch of creatures. Look at this wall. What is, what, this is a mess. How long has this been here? What are you doing every day of your life? I've got to come all the way 800 miles from Persia to get this done. What's wrong with you? Why can't you get the work done? <laughs> he did none of that. Because the blame game never accomplishes one singular thing. Nothing. Blame, blame never laid a block. All it does is sour our own spirit. Paul Chapel made a statement recently I, I thought was, was profound and yet simple. And he said this, you can make excuses or you can make a difference. People that spend their life making excuses, they don't rebuild the blooming thing. Nothing. So you can make excuses or you can make a difference in people's life. And so, verse 17, uh, they, they finally uh, 
Nehemiah said to them, he said, hey, come and let us build the wall. They had lived with the rubble their entire life and they knew what the need was. Well, they knew what the need was. I mean, they saw it. They lived there. Are you kidding me? Nehemiah says, hey, guys, guess what? Uh, the gates are burning and, the, and, and the, the, the city, the walls are in rubble. They didn't step back and say, no, you're kidding me. Is that what that is? We wondered where the walls went and what all this rock was out here. I can't believe that. No, they knew it. But listen to me carefully. Needs do not motivate people. Vision does. You can see a need all day long, but until God gives you a vision on how to meet that need, you'll never be, you'll never be motivated. They don't give themselves to need. They give themselves the vision. See, here's the difference. You can see people as hungry or you can see the people as filled. John 6, Jesus is there. His disciples are there. And Jesus looks out. There's a multitude. And one of them comes to him with a need. Uh, we got to send them away because they're all hungry. And Jesus said, well, what do we have to give them? And Philip said, nothing, not a thing. And the Bible says, Jesus, knowing already what he would do, he had a vision. You see, the disciples saw the people as hungry. Jesus saw the people as filled. It's the vision that changes lives. And so Jesus said, have them sit down in groups of 50s and 100s. So they sat down. Jesus said, well, what do you have? We got a few fish, a few biscuits. And Jesus said, bring it to me. It's the vision that made the difference, and the vision comes from the Lord. Let me tell you this. Listen carefully. Here's the difference in Nehemiah and everybody that had lived in that mess for years. Some of them grew up in it. Here's the difference. The people saw rubble. Nehemiah saw walls. They saw garbage and junk laying at their feet. Nehemiah said, I can see walls. I can see gates. You know the most frustrating thing in my ministry is when I look at people's lives and see walls and all they see in their own life is rubble. Chip, you, 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 you know what I'm talking about. Ernie knows what, you, you guys know what I, listen, here, here's the deal. We, you, you know, Chip works over with, with, with these incarcerated youth. When he goes in, he, 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 he sees what God can do in their life, but getting them to see it. Stop looking at yourself as rubble. Stop selling yourself short to a world it pays cheaply for somebody made in the image of God. And the most frustrating thing in my life is, is to see people and see the beauty that God can build in their life, but all they can see is dumpster. That's frustrating, disheartening, painful. Nehemiah had a vision of rebuilding the walls, and thank God the people followed him. They said in verse 18, let us rise up and build. And so they strengthened their hands for the good work. Last of all, and I close with this, and that is simply that Nehemiah developed a team. Oh, what a brilliant thing to do. Let's say we dismiss here. We've got to clear the gym. And we say to Al, Al, God bless you. Al, thank you for being here today. We appreciate that. And, uh, Hey, would you just send me a text and let me know when the gym is finished and everybody vamooses. Now, Al's got a motor. That's what we call it in sports. Al's got a very good motor. It does not run out. I run several miles every day. Al goes up to the mountains and runs like 35 miles. 
okay? So he's either really high on something or he's in good shape. So we could give it to Al and later we'd find out Al got the job done. But that's not how it works. First of all, there's not only a sharing of responsibility, but there's a sharing of blessings. And Nehemiah was smart enough to realize that alone he could not rebuild the walls and redesign the gates. The burden was his to begin with, but the job of getting it done had to be shared by many, and he was dependent on their help. Listen, listen, listen. He was dependent on their help. Boy, is that so true in a church? You know, you can't do it by yourself. On the desk in the Oval Office, President Reagan had a small plaque that had these words on it. There is no limit to what a man can do or where he can go if he does not mind who gets the credit. It's a team effort. Nehemiah wasn't on an ego trip. He wasn't trying to build a name for himself. He was thankful for every single person that got involved. Now, let me just take this. Listen carefully. Here's the shocking thing. Ready? Grab your chair. Not everybody wanted to be involved. Look in verse 5 of chapter 3. Watch this. And next unto them the, the Tekoites repaired, watch, but their nobles put not their neck to the work of the Lord. You know why? Because they were nobles. No, wait a minute. We're grateful for everybody building the wall, certainly. We're thankful for that. But that's below us. We can't do that. We can't get that job. We're, we're nobles. We're nobles. You can ask us to do something, but we're, we don't get our hands dirty. We, we just, we, 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 we prefer positions of leadership. We've had people like that. They came in, first time I saw one guy, he came up to me, he said, I'm willing to teach a Sunday school class, your adult class, if you need me to. And I'm thinking, I don't even know you. I don't even know who you are. You have people come and if they can't assume a position of what they consider high visibility, they don't want to hang around. I'll tell you the story. One time of years ago, I was at a, a meeting. I've been, I was young in the ministry. I'd been invited to preach at this conference, and these guys from all over America were there, and I was speaking with them. And afterwards at night, I was eating out with them. And here I'm a young guy, and here's these guys that have gotten their name on flyers and programs, and I'm walking in high cotton, we call it back in the South. Man, I'm, I'm walking in high cotton. And I came home back to my church after it was all over with and rubbing shoulders with these guys and the baptistry had run over. The water was like this deep. So I stood for hours with a shop vac vacuuming water out of the back of the church putting fans up, hoping it would be dry by the next Sunday and the musty smell would be gone. And then I got a phone call from a lady who ran one of our buses and she said, the teenagers took the bus out on their activity on Friday night and they left it a mess. And I'm thinking, the broom fits your hands as good as it does mine. Get a broom, get a dustpan, and clean the bus. And I'll talk with our youth guy later. She wasn't cleaning no bus, so I had to go out and clean the bus. And the whole time I was sweeping it up, I was griping to myself. Nobody else was there. Tell you one thing, I go preach in a meeting like that, get back, I got to vacuum up water. Now I'm sweeping this stuff up, nobody can get in and help me. Why can't they sweep the bus? They saw the bus, she saw the bus was dirty. Why does the preacher have to sweep the bus? Blah, 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 blah. And the Holy Spirit of God said, oh... You high cotton now, huh, Dean? You walk, you, walk, 
you walk with the big wigs, and so now you're, you're too good for this. You can't pick up paper, Dean. You're somebody. And he smote me in my heart and said, the day that you are too good to clean a toilet or pick up a singular piece of paper is the day that you're too big for me to use. Hey, there's nothing wrong with me sweeping. I'll sweep in here. Now, other people like to do it, and I'm grateful for that. But, but I'm not a CEO. I'm a pastor. I'm a servant. I can work just like you can work. I can get my hands dirty just like you. And the moment we feel like we are noble, and above that is the moment that God says, well, I'll just let you do it your way. So here's Nehemiah. And, and, and here's a group of people that said, nah, we're nobles, we won't, no, no, don't, don't, li listen, don't look for us, we'll let the commoners handle that. Now the thing I like about Nehemiah is he didn't get mad, didn't get discouraged, and didn't preach to the choir, you know. He, he didn't, I mean, he, he didn't, he didn't get all bent out of shape. 1 Corinthians 3, 9, for we are labors together with God. Did you know this? Did you know that when we work together for God's glory, God works with us. When we build a wall in your life, you say, I want to do something. God has led me to, God's led me to change. You know what God will do? As you get busy on the change, God will work with you. Now, the wall's not coming up overnight, so you can give up on that. But if you'll work on your life, God will work with you on your life. Labor is together with God. We are living in a difficult, different time, aren't we? Nationwide, 32% of church members have stopped going to church entirely. Digital Christianity has hurt the church financially and people that stopped coming because of the pandemic many of them never come back they're gone they've adjusted to a new way of life they don't darken the door again it's easy to drift away it's easy to just settle with what is, but what God is saying is, now is the time to build. This is the time to reach people with hope and love, to move forward, not backward. To be here, to be faithful, to be involved, to be invested in God's work. So, so let's, I mean, things are a bit of a rubble. Well, that's okay. Well, we, we, had, we had lockdown, we had this, we had... No, no, let's just rebuild. Let's just keep going. Let's look for people. Let's love people. Let's tell people about Jesus. Let's encourage the discouraged. And decide that we're going to be what God wants us to be. Could we bow our heads, close our eyes for just a moment? Building. Nehemiah builded the wall. Rebuilt what was torn down. And it may be in your life, you've got you've to wait. That's the hard part, isn't it? Yeah. The hard part is waiting. God, what do I do? I don't know what to do. Okay, then don't do anything. Just serve, worship, love, read your Bible, be faithful, come to church. Do what you know to do that is right. He'll show you the other things in His time. Timing is important. It may be, it may be that... that um, um, you need to make an assessment. Okay, where do I go from here? 
I've made some mistakes that's got me. Where do I go from here? How do I rebuild? We're making assessments even as a church. I'm grateful because of our finances. I'm thankful for our membership and your involvement. But, but we're, we're, not, we're not folding up tent. We're, we're, we're making assessments on how we can reach more people. People that hurt, people that are in need right now. Let's don't go backwards. Let's don't consign ourselves to rubble. Let's get a vision of what God would make us as individuals and how God would use us as a church. Father, help us, I pray, that we would give our life to you to become what you want us to be, Lord. Take the shattered pieces of our past and make us who you would want us to be, both as people and as a congregation, Lord. Rebuild us according to your pleasure. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. All right.